are now on page 95, and we now want to examine the role of the autonomic motor neurons innervating our internal organs or visceral effectors. Autonomic motor neurons influence the rate of activity of our internal organs or visceral effectors of the body. So before we examine autonomic motor neurons, let's give some examples of the internal organs or visceral effectors. The autonomic motor neurons essentially innervate cardiac muscle, visceral smooth muscle, and the glands of the body. So, needless to say, autonomic motor neurons, by innervating cardiac muscle, affect the rate of activity of the heart. We said that autonomic motor neurons innervate visceral smooth muscle. So where in the body do we find visceral smooth muscle? Some of the locations include the alimentary canal. The alimentary canal, of course, is the long digestive tract or intestinal tract tube that go, extends from the mouth to the anus. And the autonomic motor neurons can affect peristaltic activity. Also, uh, in the walls of blood vessels is visceral smooth muscle innervated by autonomic motor neurons. Autonomic motor neurons can cause the visceral smooth muscle in the walls of these blood vessels to contract, causing vasoconstriction, uh, and, or the autonomic motor neurons can cause the visceral smooth muscle to relax, leading to vasodilation. There's also visceral smooth muscle in the walls of our airways, like the bronchioles. Or the bronchioles contain visceral smooth muscle innervated by autonomic motor neurons. The effect we see on the airways is very similar to that that we see in blood vessels. If the visceral smooth muscle in the walls of the bronchioles contracts, that leads to bronchoconstriction. And if, if the visceral smooth muscle in the walls of the airways relaxes, that leads to bronchodilation. Where else do we find visceral smooth muscle? Visceral smooth muscle is found in the wall of the urinary bladder and can lead to emptying of the bladder. There is also uh, muscle innervated by autonomic motor neurons in the iris of the eye. But to remind ourselves of what the iris of the eye looks like, let's take a look at page 106. This is a picture on page 106. This dark spot in the center of the eye we learned is the pupil, uh, really an opening through which the rays of light pass through. And the area around the pupil is actually a pigmented muscle known as the iris. In the iris, there is both circular muscle and radial muscle innervated by autonomic motor neurons. This is actually shown in the top picture. And uh, we will see that there are autonomic motor neurons that innervate both the radial muscle and the circular muscle contraction or relaxation of that muscle and corresponding uh, pupillary dilation or pupillary constriction. Where else do we find visceral smooth muscle? In the myometrium in the wall of the uterus. Uh, of course, the myometrium literally means muscle of the uterus. And so this is also innervated by autonomic motor neurons. We just described some of the locations where we find visceral smooth muscle. Also, autonomic motor neurons innervate glands of the body. These include the sweat glands. They include the, <laughs> excuse me, the mucus secreting glands of the nose and tracheobronchial tree. Also innervated by autonomic motor neurons are the three sets of salivary glands. Also innervated by the autonomic motor neurons are the glands in the inside lining of the stomach, uh, the gastric glands that secrete gastric juice, as well as uh, the intestinal glands in the inside lining of the intestine that secrete intestinal juice, rich in digestive enzymes. Also innervated by the autonomic motor neurons is the liver. Now, the liver secretes many things, including bile. Autonomic motor neurons also innervate the pancreas. We recall that the pancreas is a unique organ that is both an endocrine gland and an exocrine gland. Most of the pancreas is an exocrine gland that produces and secretes pancreatic juice rich in digestive enzymes. Autonomic motor neurons, as we will describe in more detail, also are associated with the adrenal gland. So these are just some of the examples of the many internal organs or visceral effectors 
that are innervated and affected by the autonomic motor neurons. Now, a very interesting aspect about these internal organs or viscera effectors that we just identified is, in fact, all of these internal organs will work on their own. They do not require any nerve supply. They do not require any autonomic motor neurons to activate them, cause them to work. This is in contrast to how skeletal muscles are dependent upon somatic motor neurons to activate them to work. We say that all of these internal organs or visceral effectors exhibit automaticity. They are intrinsically active. They are active on their own. Now exactly how uh, a heart or a salivary gland or a stomach can work on its own without any nerve supply is something that we will examine in greater detail. For example, if a heart is uh, beating and it is removed from a person who has been pronounced brain dead, that heart is actually beating on its own. It is generating electrical currents. It is contracting and relaxing on its own. Uh, without any nerve supply going to it. And then it would be implanted in somebody else's chest. The internal organs do not require autonomic motor neurons in order to work. But if that's the case, if they are intrinsically active, if they exhibit this automaticity, they work automatically, then we might ask the question, why do you need autonomic motor neurons at all? Ah, the answer to that is that the visceral organs are innervated by autonomic motor neurons that influence the rate of activity. The function of autonomic motor neurons is to speed up or slow down the rate of activity. As we will see, the autonomic motor neurons in many ways act like an accelerator pedal or brake pedal on the internal organs of the body. The study of autonomic motor neurons is commonly presented in most textbooks in anatomy and in physiology in its own separate chapter, usually entitled The Autonomic Nervous System. I don't really like that title because it sounds like we have the nervous system and then we have this separate autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is within our nervous system. But let's just describe what parts of our nervous system are included in what's commonly called the autonomic nervous system. The uh, highest control center for the autonomic nervous system is the hypothalamus of the brain. In addition to the hypothalamus, there are a number of descending autonomic tracts that extend from the hypothalamus downward through the medulla oblongata and downwards through the spinal cord. There are also the autonomic motor neurons that extend from the brain and spinal cord out to these internal organs or visceral effectors of the body. Now, we wrote that the hypothalamus in our brain continuously and unconsciously is adjusting the activity of our internal organs, our visceral effectors, to match the person's physical activity and energy requirements at that time. This, of course, is the essence of homeostasis. So the hypothalamus is very important in terms of maintaining the internal environment of the body. The reason why I just thrown down the chair was to startle you. Probably didn't succeed. But the point is, is that the hypothalamus of the brain, we wrote, is greatly influenced by a person's emotional state. The area of the brain that's associated with our emotions is known as the limbic system. Neurons in the limbic system are interconnected with the hypothalamus so that emotional states affect the hypothalamus of the brain, and the hypothalamus of the brain, in turn, affects the activity of internal organs of our body. So, if you are startled, if you are frightened, which is an emotion, that uh, affects the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus, in turn, speeds up your heart rate, uh, causes your pupils to dilate, raises your blood pressure, and causes many other changes that we're going to be learning about. So if I did successfully startle you and you felt your heart rate speed up and your pupils dilated, uh, write a check to me for $35 uh, because I just did a test of your autonomic reflex response. This is page 96. And here on page 96, we see a mid-sagittal section of the brain and spinal cord. This is the hypothalamus located right here just above the pituitary gland. 
And uh, it indicates here that emotional stress and other emotions uh, uh, which are being processed in the limbic system can affect the activity of the hypothalamus. Changes in the hypothalamic activity can lead to nerve impulses traveling down uh, the, uh, the spinal cord and activating autonomic motor neurons to our heart and other internal organs of our body. Now, in fact, there are actually two types of autonomic motor neurons. There are what are called parasympathetic autonomic motor neurons and sympathetic autonomic motor neurons. In general, both parasympathetic and sympathetic autonomic motor neurons innervate every internal organ, every visceral effector of the body. Because all of our internal organs, like the heart and the stomach, are innervated by both a parasympathetic and a sympathetic autonomic motor neuron, we commonly describe this as dual innervation. Dual means double innervation. Now, the parasympathetic autonomic motor neurons primarily exert their influence, their effect, on the internal organs of our body during states of rest and or eating. And so the, this is commonly known as the rest and digest state. On the other hand, the sympathetic autonomic motor neurons primarily exert their uh, control, their influence on our heart and our stomach and our internal organs during states of stress. An easy way to remember that stress activates the sympathetic autonomic motor neurons to our internal organs is that both the word stress and sympathetic both start with the letter S. In the 1940s, an Austrian physiologist by the name of Hans Selye defines stress by using three F words. The three F words that he used were fight, fright, and flight. In nursing programs today, they commonly use what are called E words, and they will use words like excitement and emergency and embarrassment uh, and other E words to describe a stress uh, or sympathetic response. Whether we're using F words or E words, uh, the concept is essentially the same. We should view uh, these F words in their broadest context, uh, so fight, is anytime somebody is fighting, whether you are literally fighting or beating up with somebody, whether you are in a combat zone and people are shooting at you and you're shooting at them, or whether you are competing on an exam because you are fighting to win, or maybe you are betting on a hand of poker, so you are fighting to win uh, and not lose all the money you have at risk in a poker game. You should view fighting in its broadest context. Fright, of course, just means fear. So anytime you are startled, uh, taken by surprise, uh, frightened, that's a stress state. Uh, the third, flight. Flight means running. Whether you are running from a lion who's chasing after you, or whether you are running in a race, or whether you are in a car, and you're stuck on the San Diego freeway, and you're trying to get to LAX, and you only have 10 more minutes uh, to reach the LAX uh, airport in time, and you are gripping the steering wheel, and your heart is speeding up because you feel as if you are running, uh, even though you're sitting in the car uh, and you're not moving. So you should view these terms in their broadest context what all of these examples have in common is they are all associated with increased demands of energy. The increased requirement for energy uh, in order to meet these demands of stress, uh, to, in order to fight, uh, in order to uh, deal with uh, fear, in order to run.